This is an Inside Jerry's Brain Call on Wednesday, December 11th, 2019. It feels very strange that very soon we will be in 2020. I cannot get accustomed to writing that out yet, but I imagine it's going to sink in pretty soon that we are there. Um, this call was sparked by, and I will share the screen as I explain a little bit about Inside Jerry's Brain. This call was sparked by um, an article in The Nation titled, Welcome to the Global Rebellion Against Neoliberalism. Uh, and uh, the notion, this is written by Ben Ehrenreich, I, I've put it here in my brain under critiques of neoliberalism, and also connected it to lots and lots of countries in turmoil uh, this year. So 2019, um, so in Inside Jerry's Brain Calls, one of my, uh, one of the things I will apologize for right up front is that I will overshare my brain this is, this is my brain here. And as we talk about different things, if you're talking, I might actually take over the screen and start showing things that I think are relevant. I'm not trying to distract from what you're, what you're saying. I'm trying to enhance what you're saying. But, uh, uh, but for example, what I do every year, you'll see up here on the pin board, things I put up here stay up here. On the pin board, I have the year, 2019. So come January 1st, I'll change that to 2020. But if you look down under here, uh, this is what I thought was memorable uh, in 2019. And at the end of each year, these things fill up naturally. And it's really interesting to look back and see what, you know, what, en what, what ended up during the year seeming to be important. So here's uh, backlash against technology and technologists. So Techlash, uh, the Avengers movie, uh, Philadelphia shooting, Assange arrested after Ecuador ends his asylum protection, uh, Hurricane Dorian uh, whacking places, I mean, all of that. So if I go uh, down here back to um, the Nation article, uh, there are a whole bunch of countries that are having a really hard time around the world where there are street protests, some of which are provoked by seemingly small things like a, a municipal transit fare raised by 3%. But it's, I, don't think it's the, it's, I don't think it's the transit fare raised by 3% that is the problem that causes the street protests. I think it's an accumulation of things. And the article that we're pointing to here says, you know what, almost all these things trace their way back to uh, the neoliberal agenda, which is an interesting thesis. I just wanted to throw that in the middle of the conversation. And I uh, will stop sharing for a moment so I can see who all has joined us. Uh, Susan, Bo, Ken, awesome. Um, and I just want to open the floor and see where, and, and Ken, you know, it may make a lot of sense to have you take us into some of the, the deeper waters here, just, uh, and you are muted right now. Um, but if you wanna take us out into the waters, that would be great. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, I wanna put a special uh, welcome out to my friend, Michael Sillian, who's calling in from Sweden, who um, this is Michael's first call. Um, and it's nice to see the rest of you. Hello, Doug, Michael, folks, Jerry. Um, last week, Jerry emailed me and said, you know, I want to hold the Jerry, Inside Jerry's Brain call. What's on your mind? Um, which is a really big and dangerous question to ask me at any given time. So um, I had just read this article about uh, the global backlash against neoliberalism. And I had been noticing that there had been um, news reports for some time now of really massive protests in multiple countries. And this, this was the first article I saw that actually tied it together saying the underlying cause is neoliberalism, the neoliberalist agenda. Um, Jerry just said you didn't think it was the 3% uh, transit raise that caused the problem, but from what my understanding is that 3% sort of was the tipping point because it kicked a lot of people who make minimum wage into, now I have to decide do I, go to work by public transit or do I suffer and not eat food? And when it comes to that sort of choice, 3% can be a huge thing. Um, watching what's happening in Britain with Brexit, and, uh, France was just paralyzed this week by a huge strike. Um, so there's plenty of energy for change going on. And I honestly don't know what's underneath it, but I was recently on a call with um, Robert Gilman of the Context Institute and we were talking about social tipping points. And he said, you know, after the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, the media pundits were all saying no one saw this coming. He said, however, I saw it coming, as did many other people involved in um, citizen diplomacy. We 
saw for a long ways off that the Soviet empire was not sustainable because we've been talking to people on the ground. And so my question, I guess, for those of us who are on the call is, who are you talking to on the ground that um, is either in reinforcing this idea of there's, there's a tipping point being reached and things are about to change massively, or we're missing something else. Is, is there something else going on here? I really don't know. Um, but it sure seems like the energy for change is enormous at the moment. And I believe that's really a good thing. How it plays out, I don't know, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it's going in a good way. Mm -hmm. And whoever wants to just jump in. Um, and I'll add that I have, a, I have a parallel thought to this that will be the subject of a future Inside Jerry's Brain call which is, you know, are we in a generational tipping point? Um, because not only of these protests, but climate change protests and a, and a whole series of things where youth are kind of banding together and showing up in large numbers. And if they can actually link up, uh, that could be very significant. That could be a generational change of leadership across the board. I mean, if young people figure out that the moment they're, they're capable of voting in whatever, whatever jurisdiction they happen to live in, if they activate and go do things, that's that's a, you know, that's a large number of humans. Is the new prime minister of um, Finland an example? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, what's her age? 30, 37, 34. Yeah. Uh, youngest ever. And uh, Jacinda Ardern in uh, New Zealand is very young. Yeah. Um, and uh, a bunch of other people, uh, AOC and the Squad, basically in Congress. Uh, these are all uh, aspects of this. And in Finland, they now have an all-female cabinet, which is pretty remarkable. Um, yeah. And they all, the picture I saw made them all, they all looked pretty young to me. So I don't know their ages, but I went to those and went, wow, oh, this is old, this is young women. This is great. Those whippersnappers. <laughs> um, so here's the thought in my brain. Does 2020 mark a generational tipping point that I have it connected up to uh, the nerd fighters, nerd fighteria? Uh, Jacinda Greta Thunberg, who just got named Times Person of the, of the Year, the Green New Deal, uh, AOC, Generation uh, Z is basically the, the generation, but also um, the uh, Stone, Marjorie Stone and Douglas school kids uh, and their, their attempts. I mean, I think there's a whole bunch of people, and also uh, Pete Buttigieg uh, for president, who is like, um, I swear to God, he looks like Topo Gigio. Does anybody else think he looks like Topo Gigio? <laughs> Did that hit anybody else? Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh my God, we could possibly have a president who looks like Topo Gigio. But anyway, back to a serious subject. Um, Whoever just posted the thing from Financial Times, um, it's been remarkable to read The Economist and the Financial Times and, and Forbes and um, some other can usually considered right of center, very conservative financial reporting uh, organs, saying things that I never thought I'd read in their in their pages. Right. Um, that was that was Bo posting. Uh, I, yeah, uh, the Financial Times and the uh, and the the Economist, especially the Financial Times, it is clearly onto this. I mean, and. The way to look at the Financial Times is that it is the global elite newspaper of capitalists and elites of the world. I mean, the, the readership is not, you know, the Wall Street Journal, it's a, it's a very elite leadership, and they see this coming. And uh, Jerry and I have been talking for some time that I, a renegotiation of the social contract has occurred in the past. That's what the New Deal was, and it will occur, occur again. And we are definitely in that time right now. Yeah. Another um, interesting figure here is Nick Hanauer, who just recently did another TED Talk. Um, he, did, uh, he did the Beware Fellow Plutocrats, the Pitchforks Are Coming Before, but I just watched a couple of days ago uh, this one, which is The Dirty Secret of Capitalism and a New Way Forward, uh, which was pretty good. I mean, he's, you know, he's one of a few people who is out there saying, hey, look, if we keep doing this, uh, we're really going to screw up the world. Um, I'm not that crazy about, um, so here's the, the, the five rules of thumb that the new economics suggest. He's trying to propose a new economics to rethink capitalism. And he says, successful economies aren't jungles, they're gardens. We have to tend them. 
Uh, inclusion creates growth, not segregation. The purpose of the corporation is not to enrich shareholders, and he points to uh, the business roundtable recently changing their mind about that. Greed is not good, uh, which I connected. Oh, I, f I failed to connect it to greed is good, which I should, of course, do. Here is Gordon Gecko. Here's Gordon Gecko's uh, speech on YouTube saying greed is good from the movie from the 1987 movie Wall Street, which is part of uh, the liberal, neoliberal belief system, right? Uh, and a big piece of what Hanauer points to is homo economicus, this set of beliefs that individuals act in their own, in their own selfish best interest and that together the invisible hand and efficient markets make the whole thing function, et cetera, et cetera, that profit maximization, maximization is okay. All of these things that we're busy proving wrong uh, through a series of, of, you know, including through a series of Nobel Prizes and things like that. So Jerry, do you think you could put links in the chat when you're pointing out all these videos and stuff of, the, of these? And you bet. I will go find uh, a couple nodes here that I just touched and put them, put the links to those in my, in the chat. So here's. And I have a lot of FT, art, FT articles on this, but you know, there's a severe paywall there and that's why I usually email them to Jerry in, in totem so that he doesn't have to try to get behind the paywall. Thank you. I, I pay for enough subs, so um, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Me too. Um, and and uh, Doug, I come back to you a lot on this because you are an economist herder. Um, and I just wonder how your experience of that goes, what you, um, what changes have you seen over time? What hope or despair do you feel in that conversation? Um, how, how, how does that flow work for you? Well, I don't think my thoughts are very linear here. Uh, I guess Back I would on. start with the idea that uh, the big push will be to change economics from within economics mm -hmm. and maintain the same basic discussion that it has to do with capital growth. Uh, distribution becomes a minor thing on the edge, but it's to maintain the growth mechanism. My own view is that we cannot change economics from within because it systematically excluded everything to do with society and values. And if we don't get into a values and society discussion, what kind of world do we want? Uh, we're not going to be able to change anything. And uh, I think that the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal and The Economist are all trying to uh, uh, change without changing. That wonderful line from Gi Giuseppe de Lampedusa, things have to change in order to remain the same. Uh, that's what I see as the key thing, is to uh, tweak this economy so that it supports capitalism and green growth uh, without questioning the concentration of wealth that's going on or the real destruction to the environment. And do you find individuals or groups of economists in your spheres who get this and are pushing really hard on it? I mean, uh, I'm interested in the texture of it for you, like day to day, are, are they trying to rally troops? Are they contacting you and saying, hey, what do we do? Or like, like what, what's the dynamic of the community? Well, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I was in Washington last weekend and I was at a reception with a lot of economists, and I did 10 interviews uh, while talking. I talked to more people, but I made 10 interviews. And I said uh, after the chit chat, uh, oh, by the way, uh, what do you think of climate change? All 10 of them said without a, a hesitation that technology was gonna solve the problem. Ooh, wow. Uh, what I saw was an inability to let the problem in uh, to the circle of wagons. Uh, That's they really just aren't going to go there. And I think we need to be very careful about what that means. I think that people don't go to the real issues because they actually have no idea what to do. And in fact, there's no agenda of what to do. Uh, things like uh, going solar and wind as alternative electrical energies uh, don't work if you can't convert a house that burns gas to electricity, and that's a multi-thousand dollar project. And there are 80 million of those in the U.S. alone. 
Um, so that the impermeability is the anxiety around not having any plan as to what to do. Uh, I think that if you push people a little further, and some of these were willing to be pushed, these 10 people, uh, you get to a level of ex exhaustion in trying to think about what to happen, what can happen, and just terrified, actually, of uh, what's going to happen with migrations, with uh, the death of agriculture in many parts of the world. Uh, that's what you get to. And I just have to say, uh, I look around a lot. I don't see anybody having made a plan as to what actually to do at implementation. Mm -hmm. They all are clear about what the problems are. Uh, they're all clear about the need for policies. But implementation is not being discussed because actually it's impossible. Well, um, yes and no. I mean, I've got a, a whole big collection of things on mitigating climate change and lots of people trying lots of different things. And I think that I, I agree, I think completely, and I'm not sure you're saying exactly this, but I, I agree that the complexities of any effort undertaken to mitigate climate change are like whacked and crazy and, and really defeat our ability to say, okay, good, this is the one best answer and let's go try this and let's go try that. But, well, I'm, Jerry, I'm open yeah. to possibilities along those lines, but I think if you take any of, of the projects, for example, in Paul Hawkins' list of 100, uh, if you try and scale them out to the size of the problem, we're talking lots of time, lots of manufacturing, lots of distribution of technologies, all of which actually have a negative impact on the environment while you're doing it take a long time and cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So here's my thought. What to do to mitigate climate change is not straightforward. And it's, uh, I've got that under climate denier arguments. But surely it is straightforward to cease the processes that create climate change. All that does is drives the economy to zero and, and then, then what? Right? If we stop making, stop driving, stop burning, that basically grinds much of the economy to a halt is the argument. Um, and the problem? <laughs> um, it's, but, like, it's like, you know, you've got a fire. It needs fuel, it needs heat, it needs oxygen. Right. You take any one of those away, it stops. We've got uh, the equivalent of a fire destroying the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, which of the three do we take away? Not the fuel. No. no the heat, the oxygen, the better analogies, we can, we can take that pot off the burner. If we all spent um, time contemplating the virtues of a three-day working week for a while, it would solve an awful lot of trouble. Um, yes, and, and so interesting arguments like, you know, should we go to a four-day working week, a three-day working week, should people, you know, all, all those kinds of things, what happens to the world, those are great conversations that are, that are showing up because we've managed, you know, among the many assumptions we've swallowed is that everybody must work really hard all the time. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a whole bunch of really punishing policies, uh, employment policies out in the world, including the really crazy two weeks vacation a year thing which is where you start in the U.S. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's a narrative, and the narrative has been growth, the needs for strong central economies, um, export markets, globalization, comparative advantage, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we need a narrative that is distinct yeah. from that. Uh, Captain Future, what, what narratives have you been hearing? <clears throat> yeah, that's a uh, um, lot of talk. What we do here in Sweden is a model for good, but there we have our fair share of problem here as well. But we can certainly learn from each other how to do do things better. And the, the focus is like, we, yeah, we have a uh, we work not as hard here, and we've done experiment with four day work weeks and 
we have our six weeks of vacation and we have one year sh- uh, paid child care and everything and and it's all good but it's uh, uh, the level of uh, competence and wisdom uh, of the people working in in the institution organization here is not sufficient to actually understand what what's actually going on and what how is society actually works and stuff like that so, so do we need do we need more sophisticated models of what's going on of what's happening would that help i mean i'm, I'm deeply involved with uh, the thing of- the thing we need the most i think is like sense making and wisdom uh-huh yeah so that there's not even a conversation about this in sweden until recently the, the guy called thomas bjorkman and another group of people around him started raising this question about how how did we take sweden sweden was the uh, one of the most uh, uh, poor countries in Europe uh, 150 years ago, but we took it to a superstar industrial welfare nation in 100 years, and that's what I called the Nordic Secret, and wrote a book about that. And see, and it was all a program <coughs> to teach people. So they made retreat centers where they where they gathered people around about 10 percent of the population that actually spent three to six months uh, uh, teaching them how how to be nice and how to behave and how to be wise reading philosophy and the kind so. really uh, so where do we where do we learn more about this the book is called the nordic secret thomas Thank you. yeah he has a ted talk about it as well somewhere sweet yeah. thank you and i do not have it in my brain that's i'm gonna fix that yeah <laughs> So that, there's, that's, that's the talk. There's a lot of people now around, uh, uh, gathering around both the Jim Rutt Show, a podcast now. He interviews a lot of people in California. Daniel Schmatterberger, Jordan Hall, Jamie Wheel, and Nora Bateson recently, uh, today, she came out with an episode about this. They call what they call Game B, and they're, they're onto something very profound. Where they're talking about and thinking about, I think. Game, game B instead of Plan B? Yeah. So the Jim Rutt show has interviewed most of the key people there. There's also a podcast called Rebel Wisdom and one called Future Thinkers, a free good podcast around these subjects. Thank you. Game B, there we go. Oh, Jordan Hall, right. Yeah. I don't have much around Game B. Uh, I'll, I'll show everybody. I, I, have yeah. it un, un, I have it unlinked to anything, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I have it linked only to Jordan. Um, yeah. But I've got a bunch on Nora Bateson, and warm data, for example, yeah. and a bunch of things that, that, that are happening there. Uh, so, so, for example, one of the things that Nora is about, and I don't know if this is connected to Amy, she says mm-hmm. that uh, data in context is really important. She calls this yeah, warm exactly. data. And is this part of better sense making? Yeah, of course. Uh, it, it definitely a part of understanding complex uh, interactions between systems. And m- much of the science the studies we do today, then they're, they're all done in silos and and uh, not in contextual context. So. Interesting. So that's what she's talking about. We have to understand, and that create that takes a lot of <laughs> a, a lot of hard work to actually understand things. And we need a lot of more people doing that. And that's what we call navigators or weavers, so, as well. So we need a no, new whole new role in society that people who spend our time seeking wisdom and and connecting uh, what they find to others. Um, yes, and, and we've had um, multiple conversations. We have people in this Zoom room who are network weavers and connectors and so forth. Yeah. And I think that that resonates very strongly with us. Yeah. Um, Doug, go ahead. You wanted to jump in? Yeah, Jerry, on the issue of modeling, I think we have pretty good models of what's happening. And I think we're pretty clear about that. What we don't have good models of is what we might do. So take, for example, going to the three-day work week. People think, oh, that's great because it saves a lot of energy. There's less commuting. But the obvious thing is what are people going to do with their two new free days? They now have to heat their house rather than their office. Uh, They are going to spend the time uh, shopping or going around or entertaining the kids. So the model there would say maybe there's not much payoff for going to a three-day work week. Uh, We have to take all the proposals and work out the secondary consequences, and we're not doing that. And secondary consequences and unintended consequences are very hard to predict and very hard to model. So, so we, we, we can try, you know, you know, plans are useless, but planning is pretty helpful. 
Well, let me give an example of where I think we could do it. And that is uh, shifting from coal produced or oil produced electricity to solar and wind produced electricity. People think that if you get the price down to being equal to what happens with coal and gas, the problem is kind of solved, but it avoids the problem of the conversion of 80 million homes that are heated with gas to being heated with electricity. We could model that pretty easily, but it isn't being done. People stay with the idea. I'm getting funny. My apologies. I was I clicked on the link to the TEDx talk and it started playing and I couldn't stop it in time and that was the problem. I, I, I blew that. I should have well, muted myself before going there. So I think the modeling of possibilities would be really helpful because I think people would get stuck up on possibilities that we already know basically aren't gonna work. So so I'm I'm deeply interested in this modeling thing in general and mapping and mind mapping obviously because we're in inside Jerry's brain. But there's a possibility that I'm assembling some resources and some funding to rethink this brain-like thing and to go into some new infrastructure that lets us do collaborative sense making better. So I'm gonna come back to this topic a whole bunch in this call sequence because, because A, this matters and because maybe more importantly, this, this could be materializing into an actual project. And part of my goal in that, my own current goal as best I understand it, is to facilitate lots of different people with lots of different tools approaching these problems and, and, and sharing what they learn and, and how they learn it. Meaning this has to be a, an environment of kind of open shared distributed data and various analytic tools that allow us to come in and create narratives and, 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 and explanations for what, what's going on and what to do. Um, and then play them out and model them in different ways. But um, if anybody knows big thinkers on those fronts, I'd love to connect with them because I think that uh, that's going to. Jerry, um, I think we I think we need simpler models. Uh, good, I, more I was, complex models. I think we need simpler models that okay. that are absolutely undeniable by almost everyone. Has anyone ever played musical chairs? Mm -hmm. Okay, so imagine that you're playing musical chairs with lots and lots of people, and periodically there's a chair taken away. But people don't get out of the game. They have to figure out how to sit on the chairs that are left. Sit faster so, than everyone else. So, well, no. Everybody has to figure out how to sit on the chairs that are left. Right. So periodically, they keep taking chairs out of the game. But the people left have to figure out how to sit on the chairs that are left. Now, imagine that the chairs are actually money. So that the the people in the economy have to continue to figure out how to live on less and less money in circulation. And no, Michael, this is not an entry for you. <laughs> uh, so, and periodically, the government has to do deficit spending to put money back into circulation. Because the last thing I read, that the rich currently have over $30 trillion in offshore tax shelters. Where do you think it came from? It's not, I mean, that's the thing that Hanauer talks about over and over again is the rich, the problem with the rich isn't that they're rich, it's they don't st spend their money. Um, you know, he talks about how many pair of pants does he buy? How many cars does he buy? How many houses does he buy? The money that he accumulates doesn't circulate anymore so that the people in the economy are, the flow is starved. And the, and the musical chairs thing is something that just, showed up this morning and and I sort of like it. Musical chairs is a really simple game and it's a, it's a vivid metaphor. So that, that's really interesting. Thank you for, for the contribution because everybody I think understands it. Although you just applied it in a way that ran a little counter to my intuition around it because to me the, the basic principle of musical chairs is somebody, keep, somebody keeps removing a chair and everybody else is always fighting over the chairs and reframing that game you know, so that we can all have a chair is I think maybe the, the interesting question. Uh, Doug, you wanted to jump in? Well, I was just gonna say about mu musical chairs that the people who don't get the chairs actually have lost. They've got mm -hmm. nothing to sit on. And in a way their ability to adapt is gone because they're not allowed back in the game. 
if we think of the chairs as being jobs rather than money, I think the analogy is much closer. I'd say we have to think of the chairs as being life support. Life support is being removed constantly. You know, we are converting forests into cash and leaving behind waste heaps. And so we're all having to, we have more and more people on the planet with fewer and fewer, um, I hate to use the word resources, but, but less and less life support available for them until what happens, you know, we're already way out past the edge of the cliff, hovering in the air before you look down to find out that we've, we're in. So this is all a Hanna-Barbera cartoon is what you're telling us. Exactly. It's, uh, <laughs> is it Hanna-Barbera or is it, is it Looney Tunes? I don't know which one was like, like a uh, coyote and wolf. One way or another, it's going to be, uh, yeah. that's all folks. <laughs> uh, that, you know what? That, that's, that little conclusion is going to be like what we're going to see at the end screen in the restaurant at the end of the universe. Yeah. Um, and, and while I agree with what's being said, what if musical chairs, what if, what if buying the chair narrative is the problem? And what if we all sat comfortably together cross-legged on the ground? I mean, for some very strange reason this morning, I was sitting pondering how furniture started and how we all started getting chairs. And Except we all started getting chairs is a Western conceit because you go to other cultures, you go to Arab cultures, and they sit very comfortably on carpets uh, and pillows in their rooms. And it's like room after room that is very comfortable for a whole lot of people. Uh, and where sitting in chairs is, a, is an odd custom that lots of cultures around the world ended up having to adopt because, as they got westernized. It was simply a piece of, of Western, westernization like wearing suits, right? Uh, Doug, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what, sitting on the ground would imply a culture change. And the existing elite is going to do everything they can to prevent that culture change because it would interfere with the flow of cash towards them. So culture change is on the agenda, but nobody knows how to get there because the uh, forces, the conservative, the conserving forces are so strong in this society. I think, I think everybody's busy fighting that battle. I, and every, I don't mean everybody, but I mean there, there are large parties who are busy trying to figure out what the new narratives are to control our, you know, the scripts that run in our heads. And this is the titanic battle of, of the ages. We are at a weird punctuated equilibrium moment right now um, where all these narratives are in flux, where we're, we're busy trying to figure out what, uh, is it capitalism, is it socialism, is it, is it democratic socialism, is it, is it capitalism with a Chinese bent? Is, like what's the right model for a country? And then how does the social contract, uh, how is that supposed to work? Should we all emulate Denmark and Finland? Uh, or, or should we go invent some other sort of thing? Or should we, uh, re re should we reconsider money? Should we re reconsider property and ownership? Should we, re should we remember the commons and start living on the commons together? I mean, all these questions are, and I love this about this moment, all these questions are hot questions right now. We're, 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 we're like at a, at a moment where these are all okay questions to be asking. And a few people are having all these conversations, but in some communities, they're trying to avoid the conversations. Doug was saying earlier how, you know, some, some parts of the economic community are trying to avoid uh, the, the penetration of, of important questions about what to do and, and, and how things work. Uh, or, or they've offloaded the implications of, of the situation to uh, technology will fix that, right? Uh, things of that nature. But, but I adore that we're at a moment where we can have this conversation and it's meaningful and it's happening in many different places. Also where our sharing of resources is simple, easy, productive, uh, leads us each to go like follow different rabbit holes of information down. I'm, I've got now a series of, of, of videos to watch, you know, as a result of this conversation, et cetera. But then feed that back into the world of this collaborative sense-making set of communities and artifacts. So I, 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 I love all that. Ken. I'm uh, going back to something Doug said earlier. You know, I think we enter into the conversation in the wrong place, a lot of us. We enter into how do we fix it? And that's way far down the line. I think what we need to be doing is, is convening conversations with multiple stakeholders, which include women, people of color, the young, the old, the very young, the very old, the, the people who have not yet been born, animals, all of these folks, because of a council of all beings um, approach um, from Joanna Macy's work that asks, what type of world do we want to create? What are the 
what are the shared concerns and the things that need to be addressed throughout time, whether you're born now or 10,000 years from now or 50,000 years from now, what needs to be there for humans and other life forms to flourish? And then once we've got a sense of what that is, then start to say, and what systems would allow that to happen? And then what actual steps would allow, would we need to take to create those systems? So that's how I see the, the creating more coherence in this conversation. Because when we get into, we have a problem to fix, we, you know, we've got climate change, we have this or that. When we look at the world as a set of, of um, problems, we go into problem solving mode. And that's, that leads to technical fixes rather than adaptive shifts in our way of thinking. When we start to think about the world as a set of shared concerns and recognizing that everybody's got a legitimate claim to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, whatever the, the things are. The last one I saw is um, soil, soul, and society. Mm -hmm. you know, if we start to design human existence for flourishing, we get very different outcomes than if we, we look at how do we fix the mess that we're in. It's my little and, and And courtesy of Mr. Homer, I had a, a conversation yesterday with Hildy Gottlieb, um, which was mind-blowing and, and absolutely delightful. And one thing I will point to here, she has a, she's created a process. Uh, she, she runs a, a, a small group called Creating the Future. She's created something called Catalytic Thinking. And the three questions that crack assumptions are lovely to ponder. Uh, and this is informed by things like appreciative inquiry, which is a... a Oops, got to spell it right. <clears throat> um, appreciative inquiry is basically a, a process that says that uh, focusing on problems creates negative discourse, which spirals downward because we're all busy trying to fix problems as opposed to, <clears throat> and also that focusing on problems causes us to look for who, who caused the problem and accuse the other, et cetera, et cetera. And that the right, the right approach is to look for positive things we might do together, even with people who have very different opinions from us. So this is one of the many streams that informs the catalytic thinking process. But the three questions that Hildy um, is trying to get us focused on is, like, what is possible? What is the best possible thing that, that could happen? What brings out the best in us? What do we think of each other is, is another framing for that. And then what do we have together? What can we build together? What can we make together? And I like these questions a bunch. Uh, one of her, her beliefs is that changing the questions we ask changes our assumptions, changes our whole framing and belief systems. And I agree with that. So, so I like, Ken, you're pointing out that we're, we're coming at this wrong, we're asking the wrong questions. I think that's very likely true. And I think also that, I'm gonna overgeneralize here, but the, the male analytic uh, way of looking at things probably contributes greatly to that. That we're not, we're not thinking, we're, we're thinking about this in, in you know left brain yang uh, kind of kind of ways and softening that and opening ourselves to other ways of seeing these issues would probably help a great deal as well. Uh, Doug, go ahead. I'm muting myself here. Uh, getting the mouse in the right place. Hmm. Uh, as, as some of you know, I've been thinking a lot about what the possibilities are of what could happen. And I like to start with the basic needs. It seems to me that food is emerging as one of the real anxiety points. And we're gonna to have to do a lot to create new ways of making food. The other thing that's gonna be a big need is habitation. Because living in big houses that are heated with gas are not gonna be part of the future. So if we start with food and habitat as the design goals, then we begin to think of what kind of civilization we could make that would meet those in a new and interesting and adequate way. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful conversation to have. Agreed. And then there's a bunch of people working in extremely different ways on these issues of food and habitation. Everything from <clears throat> regenerative agriculture uh, to, you know, uh, manufactured foods, synthetic foods of different kinds, uh, urban farming, all, all, you know, all different kinds of things. One of the striking things about a lot of that conversation is that it looks at agriculture, new ways of growing things, but there are no people in the pictures. Uh, I think the idea of combining the agriculture with habitat is really an attractive civilizational moment. Well, and then one of the other <clears throat> funny little assumptions here 
and this is a pet peeve of mine, is that wildlife should be preserved with no humans in it. That, that we need to create spaces on earth that are human free. And one of my beliefs is that humans who know what they're doing are really good for the landscape. Um, and I connect this back to um, 1491 and 1493 and uh, books about Australia and how basically North, South, North America, South America, and Australia were all under active human management before Europeans showed up and obliterated the knowledge of how to do that and allowed the, the land to be reclaimed and, and sort of rewilded by itself. But that while these lands were under active human management, they were intensely productive. They, it was easy to live on those lands. They were really fruitful uh, in different ways. So, so uh, just a tiny sliver of that is, why do we insist on, on making sure that nobody lives on, on pieces of land? Why can't we uh, encourage sort of the active use of, of land in the, in the smartest ways we uh, know how to do? Um, Susan, thank you for, for joining us here. And I see you nodding a lot about these things. I'm wondering, which of these things uh, trigger for you and, and what, what part of this would you have us focus on? And you're muted right now. Well, I feel a little uh, hesitant to participate because it's a new group to me, I, although I know a couple of you, uh, Ken and Doug, my goodness, since uh, Spirited Work Days, it's been a long time. It's really beautiful to see you. Yeah, and these are such big questions. I have more questions than I do have answers, but I think as I wrote in the chat for me, I, I come more from Ken's orientation probably, but that it really is a spiritual question. And when we move from the current, this and a lot, I, I do find the way Michael Lerner talks about this helps me uh, understand it. So moving from the paradigm of scarcity and which leads to everything of dominion and we have to get a piece of the pie and we objectify and other each other, which we're just seeing the extremes, not only of climate change, but of othering on the planet right now, everywhere. It's just an infectious disease. So we've got to shift to, to um, caring and love, basically. It, it sounds very schmaltzy, but it's really all we need if we move to love and really truly feeling that we are one with each other, we're one with the earth, with the animals, then we'll figure it out because it all comes from that. Um, so I think so many things have disconnected us. So my main practice is compassionate listening. And we believe we're so wounded and hypnotized by our culture and the lessons and the wounds we get we are not in contact with that. And we're afraid to even admit it or open to it. Like that makes us unsafe. We won't be able to survive in the world. We won't get ours. And so it traps us in that place of fear. And so we can't think in a new paradigm, you know, the way Einstein reminds us that from this place of being in that paradigm of scarcity and fear and separation and othering, we can't solve this. So to me, it is a big part of the question is how do we make that leap? And I've been in a couple of experiments this year of uh, what is the we space is, is the way it's called. You've probably heard about that. So partly with Terry Patton in the New Republic of the Heart and then also with Thomas Hubel. I, I hope you're familiar with his beautiful deep work. Talk, yes, talking about trauma healing and uh, and I and and also Patricia Albert, this transpersonal space, and I'm really experiencing for myself, and then can bring this in places where I go, that we really can transform everything within ourselves and between ourselves when we when we come from that deep essential part of ourselves, that the deeper knowing, like our little three and four year old kids know. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's all for now. Thank you um, very much, very much. Um, <clears throat> I did a video some years ago, <clears throat> I shot it on the beach, <clears throat> the Oregon beach. And it, it basically, um, it seems like it's apropos here for this conversation and the conversation I had in the last hour and a half, which is, um, I asked the question, why, do eco why are ecology and economy so different <clears throat> when they both come from the same root? And mm. I, I, you know, Doug and I have talked about this before a bunch. But the, the root of ecology and economy is oikos, which is the household. <clears throat> and both of them seem to be about the management of the household. And my own 
little amateur theory on this was that in economics, the household is seen as me and my immediate nuclear family. The household is small and mm -hmm. private, and it's all about ownership and competition with other households for a scarce set of resources. <clears throat> and then in ecology, the household is the planet and the ecosystems within it. And that we need to maintain the whole household or none of us are going to do well and we will all suffer. Yeah. <clears throat> and that this shift from, and I'm oversimplifying here, but seeing the household as the larger, not the smaller, could lead us to understand that we are all deeply intertwingled, that what affects me affects you, that yes. there's a whole bunch of beliefs we're trying to get people <clears throat> to absorb when one of the, the winning narratives of the last couple of decades has been that being greedy and self-interested will work because in the aggregate, the invisible magical hand will subtly, you know, you know, make this all work. So don't worry about other people doing so is stupid. Don't there's no such well. thing as, there's <laughs> no such thing as society. Um, so, so just go ahead and be selfish. And as W said, after nine 11, just go shopping, shop more. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the answer. Right. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that's kind of the battle is, is like how we see ourselves and what is our vessel what is our container? What, you know, um, and, and then we get lots of different people with really interesting ideas about how to, how to explain this, like donut economics, which I like but don't like. Um, because I think, it's, I think it's really hard to navigate inside a donut. Have you ever done that little mirror thing where you try to draw a line in a, you know, uh, backwards by looking in a mirror? It's really uh, hard. So, yeah, yeah. So, so to me, donut economics, staying within boundaries, feels like it's not abundance mentality and it's not yeah. it's not trying to figure that out but i like the idea and it's gotten really popular and there's 50 things like donut economics that are out there the two percent solution i mean i, I I'll, I'll go to my brain as soon as i've talked yeah. stop talking and show uh, what some of these models are and i think that 200 years from now we'll look back and the name of this era will be with it, whatever the name was of the winning theory that got us out of this fix that we're in unless this thing plays out really poorly, in which case the name of this era will be when we lost our handle on civilization and destroyed the earth. Yeah. Right? And, and we're kind of at that, at that little cusp right now where it could swing either way. Yeah. So I would just like to interject two things. There was talk earlier about the youth, see, and I think they see through this a lot more. They see, well, even their experience as kind of global, what do they call them? I mean, they're really global citizens. They have friends all over the world. They have from the beginning, you know, they play their games online with people all over the world. They understand that borders don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the analogy I like to use for understanding the wholeness, I, I like to always turn to our body in a kind of organic way. So I realized, thank goodness, my liver is, knows its uniqueness. And so does my kidney and et cetera, they, and they know they're totally that and how to do that. And they also know at the same time, they're 100% me, uh -huh. the whole. And in the same way, it's really kind of mind boggling, but when we think about our body, we can get it. And so it is with each of us right here, right now, we are each totally separate, but we are all 100% interconnected. And, and the more we can really get that, I think our behavior will change because just as we love and care for our family and our tribe, when we finally understand we're all part of the same tribe, including the four leggeds and the trees, then we, we can solve, we can act differently and, and shift our, our way of being. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. And, and, and and sort of, sort of sadly, I think we're kind of preaching to the choir here. I think that, that all of us on the call more or less buy these things and agree with these things and wish that whoever our other is with a capital O also could consider the possibility of, of, thinking, of seeing this way and, and feeling this way. So, so I, I, I love the way you articulated that. And I'm like, okay, so how do we, how do we propagate that? How do we... How do we open a conversation with people who believe very differently? And, well, I'm and actually co-leading a group to Alabama in a couple of weeks, so I'll have an interesting experiment and experience with that. I'll, uh, if yeah. there's another meeting, I'll report back to you. <laughs> I love that. And, and would you mind spending a couple of minutes explaining a little bit about Terry Patton's process, the New Republic of the Heart? Because I've got it in my brain, but I know nothing about it really. Um, well, Terry wrote a book 
a few years ago, I don't exactly remember when, called the New Republic of the Heart, which is a great articulation of a lot of what we're talking about. He personally is very, uh, his focus is climate change. So he decided to convene, oh, sorry, let me turn this off. Oh, except it might be something it I It might be Terry Poppin, who knows? No, I don't know. It might be that we're having document credit. So I'll oh, come shoot. back in a okay. minute. So go on without me for a moment. Cool. I will mute your line. Well, Michael's shaking his head. Michael, did you want to yeah. say something? Oh, I always want to say something. I, I, I remember Hazel Henderson once telling me that if we all achieve the sense of being a bear in the woods that would sort things out and i suggested that the bear doesn't need to sort itself out it's in the woods already um, people becoming like bears is not going to solve the problem mm -hmm. um, i can't learn to play a beethoven sonata by deciding that i would like to play a beethoven sonata there's um, um, a disastrous hole, I believe, in this theory that if we all get together and love one another, it will all work. I absolutely repudiate that possibility. All you need is love. Give me a break. Sorry, we need, we need to understand the reality of our situation, the technology that's, that's causing us trouble. Switch off that technology, apply other technologies. There needs to be changes in the functionality of human behavior. And for me, that's about money. And for me, it looks dead simple. I, I keep listening to these conversations and wondering, what are the criteria by which a serious proposal is acceptable as, as possible in some way? I mean, I, I recall that old parable, the guy in the floods who was offered relief and he said, no, God is coming, you know. And gradually, God said, well, I sent you a helicopter. Right. right. And two boats. You know well, I feel the same thing here. The question I would like to leave today is, how do we know when something is an appropriate and possible and substantial response to this situation? Right. Now, I, I build that into Douglas, the, the food and habitation issue is it. Yeah. If we can handle food and habitation, then we have also handled energy. I think there's one word I want to call up from your sentence, which gets us in trouble, which is substantial. And that, and that I remember like, like long ago, I was an advisor to AT&T labs back when AT&T was actually still AT&T and Dave Nagel was in charge of the labs. I was part of his advisory board and they, they couldn't consider a business if it wasn't going to be a multi-billion dollar business real soon now. Mm -hmm. And so, and so they got killed by IP telephony, for example, because every engineer knew that TCP IP is a stupid way to do telephony until yeah, by, they... by substantial, Jerry, to cut that, I do not mean big. So, so but partly I, I think, I think I'm with you entirely in, in the spirit of what you mean, but we keep looking for really big solutions that solve the problem for a lot of people all at once, kind of in an engineering way of frame of mind. And I think a lot of the things that a lot of us are fans of, are behavioral and adaptive and, and can, can work at small scale in a lot of places, which turns into large scale when you add up the numbers. Like, like so, you know, and, and I like to say that it won't scale are the three words I've seen kill more good ideas uh, yeah. in the world. Um, well, if the, yeah, if the sense of scaling is the standard linear aggregation right. and, and growth by power, if the sense of scaling, however, has more to do with mycelium, the propagation of ideas across the subculture, then the emergence of these things can happen all over the damn place. So it's like that. It's like mushrooms. We, we've got to be we've got to be thinking in, in new new analogies in this process. Mm. Sorry, you, I, I just have to rant occasionally. <laughs> Love thing. that. So here's a mushroom talk. Here's mycelium. I, I love mycelium as a metaphor and as a yes. thing. Uh, and uh, somebody, somebody wrote that we are in the fungularity. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Wow. Michael, I, I want to join Nora Rayford. Uh, uh, love is all you need is not, is not all you need. I, I think love is requisite. Um, 
And by love, I use Umberto Maturana's definition of love is granting legitimacy to the other, no matter how the other arises in your awareness. Um, mm -hmm. Once you grant someone legitimacy and say you have a legitimate right, then you can enter into a productive conversation. But um, the idea of love being all you need, it, it is very insufficient. You know, you got to have elbow grief, hard work, and arguments, and, oh, yeah. and bad feelings, and you know, ways to deal with the bad feelings that don't involve killing. Um, and I particularly object to the premise that we are lacking love at, at present. My, my, my perception is that there's so much love operating in the world, otherwise we would have killed each other stone dead six generations back, <laughs> right? Like the, 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 the world operates in this vicious, violent, ugly situation is a testament to the depth of love that is inherently amongst us already. Mm -hmm. So let's not say we need to love more. Let's say we need to love more intelligently. Well, Michael, there are, there are different perspectives on love. Thank God right? for that. In other words, the, <laughs> the, the rich who are in control love the control. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and you know, to the, the thoughts about different ways of thinking, well, it's good to think differently. At the same time that you do that, you have to be aware of, of the construct within which we are confined. Mm -hmm. the, the, those who are in control that continue to do things to maintain control. I mean, I just went back and, and read Chomsky's Requiem for American Dream again, and it's horrifying. Mm -hmm. right? what, what is being done to us on an ongoing basis, mostly without our awareness, and, and then reading Democracy and Change by McLean, and I'm even more horrified. Um, I, Personally, I think John Glubb is right in that the average lifetime of an empire is 250 years and we're about to explode. Mm -hmm. And Gene, I, I, I created a thought where I collected up the, the different materials that you were talking about. I don't know if you've seen this. I want to say I, I think I was being a little facetious when I was saying all you need is love. Obviously, we need lots, lots more. But I think once we are really connected to ourselves and each other through love, unconditional love, accepting everything, all, you know, not othering parts of ourselves or each other, then we are able to deal with, with everything else, including conflict, which is, in fact, my special, my my calling is to help us step into conflict mm -hmm. it's it's an important beautiful energy it's just telling us we need some attention sure. I, I always remember that um a teacher of mine dan and perry used to say that the conflict is a cry for intimacy it's really saying we lack love so when we when we have the love then i think we have the container within which we can step into the fire and we can deal with our issues in wise ways. There's also really nice ways of uh, framing conflict as an opportunity to step into something. Or there's a, a hostage negotiator, Chris Voss, who's really interesting. And he says, no is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like, like w when you get a no, you have a response. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an, you know, and when somebody has said no to you, it puts them in a different place in their relationship with you in a place from which they're more open to think, to say, to consider, to do anything else. Mm. He's got really interesting ideas uh, because he's been high stakes negotiations around lives, but, but he has really interesting ideas about how communication is framed, received, connected uh, between us. And then one of the thoughts I put up, I uh, showed earlier that's in my brain is that we, this is one of my beliefs, that we are in an epidemic of not listening. That, that we, we truly, uh, most of us, when listening to somebody are busy preparing our rebuttal um, rather than absorbing what is going on. And, I, and I'm really torn by this because in inside Jerry's brain calls, I'm listening, but I also want to share what I've thought about this issue before. So I'm busy then trying to stay present to what's being said while going and fetching the thing and sharing the screen. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard. Um, and I, I fear that I'm sacrificing a piece of the listening in doing so, but my apologies, my apologies for that. Um, I'm curious, uh, John, Susan, Bo, you haven't jumped in that much. Any, any thoughts? I want to just pause because uh, make, make a little room for 
for people who haven't uh, seized the floor, in case you'd like to take the floor. Okay, well, I'll take a little shot. Uh, Go both. About I'm really enjoying all these different perspectives. Uh, so I, I am, in many ways, an economist. And I was just on a previous call, and I was pointing out to Jerry that um, economics is a, has a very a big ethical dimension that nobody admits. And this is the kind of thing that gets buried in models, which can be very dangerous. It is, it's full of ethical choices about who deserves what resources. And so I'd like to point that out and, that, and to make it clear that that's what's going on. And we need an honest conversation about that. And frankly, when we cover it up with models and theories, we don't have an honest conversation. Um, a, a second thing is that uh, um, uh, capitalism is this thing that we don't even really just define very well. Something going on? Okay. Somebody's mic. I think it's noise from someone else's uh, okay. line. Don't know. Go ahead. So all capitalism is, and it's not, it's not that it's a small thing, is rationing resources via a market. And it's the best thing we figured out to do after the fall of feudalism. And it seemed, and we, but we present it to ourselves as the only way and de facto just never argue with it. And in fact, yes, we can argue with it. It is a rather recent development on this planet and we have the utter right to question it ethically and in, in, in every way. And uh, whenever I hear talks of, of models, um, all these assumptions are buried in these models. Like Max Weber's The uh, Protestant Work Ethic, you know, that, that capitalism is just loaded with Protestantism. It's loaded and just freighted with you know, judgments about what's the worthwhile life, what should people be doing. And if you, we want to rejigger the system, all of those things have to be confronted. Otherwise, we'll be having conflicts about things that we're not really even, it's not bubbling to the top of the conversation, but we're just taking it for granted because it's implicit, because it's built on us. Uh, I think that's all I'd like to add so far, and I'm really enjoying everything that people's, all these contributions. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, Bill. Susan, John, if you want. Cool. Um, anybody else? There, there I am. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, good. I was, just, I was just going to, uh, I couldn't find my unmute button. Um, that, that's what our lives are going to be like in the future. So that's going to be our, our primary issue is no longer going to be bad. <laughs> or do I have Wi-Fi? It's going to be, I can't find how to unmute. Yeah. Um, I was trying to find a framework. <laughs> that I used to use um, to talk about how it is that we get to how we actually, you know, make sense of things and how to slow things down in a, in a conversation uh, so that we, we actually follow through to the, to the end of a, a sort of cycle. People try to make it linear, but it really is sort of um, asking a bunch of questions like ass assuming that as I mean, Bo just did it. I, I used to code conversations this way. <laughs> the uh, assuming that when you go into an interaction with people, that that it's that it's always what they have to say comes in as data, right? And it comes in, and it has to be, oh, what is this? What is this? You know, and and all the questions about, and what does it mean for me? And what does it mean for us? And what is it? All of these things, those questions. You can, you can sort of, I've, I've done it in numbers of groups where you, you just can see the dysfunction. I mean, it's just, it's, nobody gets past any, <laughs> is, or is taken past with something. And so somewhere here, I have that model. And, um, and I also have five lovely questions um, and I'll try to dig them up because you can sort of say, well, uh, it, just, it just slows down. It's part of the whole listening thing. Um, I'm sure there's oodles of them out there. Mm -hmm. But we don't hold ourselves to it very well. Yeah, not at all. When things are sort of hot and heavy, we just jump in. And there's a nice practice of taking a breath before speaking. 
which is yes, yes, and it's perfectly natural to do that. That's mm -hmm. the problem. It's not. It's uh, it's the way our brains do. You know, I mean, it's the whole system one, system two. I don't care what model you have. Yeah. There's a great practice I got from Craig Neal. He used to hold these um, before the age of Skype and Zoom. We'd get on something called a conference call, and yeah. then. 60, 80 people on the call and you couldn't see them. And he'd open it up for comment and he'd say, before you speak, after, the, after someone finishes, before you speak, allow two heartbeats before you speak. And the remarkable thing was that when people practiced that, there would be very few people who would talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. Something about two heartbeats allowed enough of a space for 80 people for someone to say, finish speaking, and someone else to let two heartbeats go and speak. And it really, had an amazing rhythm and flow to it, which, you know, when you think about heartbeats, is all about rhythm and flow, right? Yeah. And I think that it goes well with all the neurological findings of, of you know, how it is that we work and why we work the way we do. And, if, if I may and almost that. every culture has some way of dealing with this. And we, we have Robert's Rules of Order. For instance, yeah. but there are talking sticks. Talking sticks, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes about, some people think it's about turn taking. It, it's not about turn taking exactly. It's about um, taking the floor, getting the floor, being given the floor. Um, and you have to have all those things in play before, before you are allowed to, to, to do that. There are all kinds of all kinds of things around decision making. There's also a, <laughs> a wonderful decision making experience that I went through, which was um, based on how it was that American Indian tribes actually got up and moved so fast from their village. Mm -hmm. And the process that was going through was was very simple, right? It was a very simple thing thing and and it was people you know from the west and the north and the south and the east and then you know there were the warriors and there were the this and there were that you played played roles and you stuck to your role you know and the questions were well what what according to my role and what i'm responsible for what is it that we um, that what is it that we sorry is that your phone susan uh, sorry, we have two Susans. Uh, uh, Susan Park, now your, your, your line is muted, so it, probably, it couldn't be you. Um, right, and it's not me. <laughs> okay, good. So, and I don't have a phone that makes that noise. I don't have an iPhone, so, so there we yeah. are. All right, so anyway, the point is the questions are very simple. I'm just going back to underscore. Yeah. This notion of, you know, simple, simple but work, workable. I mean, none of them is any more right than the other, but they, they all you know, contribute um, something anyway. So it was sort of like, I remember being a warrior and it was sort of like, okay. Um, the question was, what will happen if we do this? And what will happen if we don't do this? Mm -hmm. And just asking those two simple questions from a point of view gets you a long way toward bringing implications to the table. Doug, you wanted to jump in a little while ago? Nope. Okay. Um, Ken, go ahead. Just, Susan, thank you. You just struck something in my mind for me. Um, Doug and Jerry and a couple other people on this call know that I'm involved in a, a project around researching uh, the impacts of uh, the rising tides here in the Bay Area. And um, so I, introduced, I interviewed a woman from the BCDC, the Bay Area Coastal Development Commission. And they were formed in the 1960s as a bureaucracy with the express purpose of slowing down the, the filling in of the bay. And you know, bureaucracy is something that slows things down. It is designed to move very slowly um, because there was this huge you know, development going on. Now they have to become their opposite. The bay is filling in with water. It is expanding, and they have to figure out how to move quickly in order to adapt to that because hmm. the old bureaucracy rules aren't going to work. They recognize they have to move a lot faster, and yet their very constitution is of 
how do we keep things really slow and put layer after layer of impediments and obstacles up? So um, I just throw that out as sometimes you know, everything, as, as um, you just mentioned, everything's a cycle, right? So sometimes you come full circle and it's like, okay, we have to reinvent ourselves now and move very quickly and nimbly and, and figure out how to remove obstacles so that we can actually adapt to the changing currents of what's happening around us. And how did they come to that realization? because they're looking at the science that says we're going to see significant sea level rise here in the Bay area. And it's probably. How gonna... did... But how do they, how did they make the shift from. Uh, actually I should qualify and say the, they may not be in that position as an entity. The yeah. person I was speaking with has this recognition mm -hmm. and is working inside the organization to help them arrive there but the entity itself as a as a governmental organization is not there yet although it is dawning on more and more people that okay we have to do this um i went to a something called charge recently which was a, a gathering of flood control managers floodplain managers people who are you know civil engineers folks who are the ones that, they're the ones that get sued if people get flooded right and they're recognizing that all the data they've been working with, all the projections about what to expect for sea level rise in the Bay Area are off, way off. And they're like, we've built policy and put procedures in place based on seeing a foot between now and 2050, and we could see two meters between now and 2050. How do we now adapt to that? So right. I think one of the ways that they're waking up to this is just sheer fear. It's, it's the recognition of, holy shit, things are way worse than we thought they were going to be, and what are we going to do about that? And the, the runways at SFO could go underwater at, at well, two, two, two meters SFO rise probably. SFO is the one entity that, that can handle it because they'll just raise prices, and they have money, their own money. They don't have to worry about money and funding, so they'll just keep building up berms around the airport. Right, um, right. And it's a limited, limited territory, so they can do it that. Is, it is, but it's very interesting to see all the different players in this and to, to figure out who the players are that like to play with each other and cooperate, yeah. who does not. For example, um, the Army Corps of Engineers is its own entity, and then the, the um, Northern Pacific Railroad has got lots of right-of-ways in the Bay Area, and they don't pay attention to anybody. They do whatever the hell they want, right? And so Absolutely. there's cowboys, and there's cooperators, and it's really, really fascinating. And are you familiar yeah. with the well, three people story from LA? With the which story? Three people? I don't think so. Um, so briefly, and this is an old story, but, uh, so Andrew Lipkiss, uh, who founded tree people, which was basically about planting trees, discovers one day that, uh, the army Corps of engineers, I think is about to raise the, the walls of the drainage, the flood control ditches across LA because it never rains in LA, but when it does, there's so much pavement that it really creates a crisis. He then goes to them and says, Hey guys, this is really, really stupid. Um, you should be breaking up concrete and planting trees so that the, you know, the, the water will be absorbed everywhere locally, et cetera. But then somehow, and I've forgotten the story, he discovers that there are tons and tons of agencies at you know, federal, state, local, whatever, uh, private, that have overlapping boundaries, mandates, resources, et cetera, that have, are never talking to each other. Mm -hmm. They are just not in conversation. He facilitates that conversation, which leads to a lot of good things. Um, so, so I think you're seeing, you're, you're, you're right in the middle of a similar situation and maybe Lipkiss would have some interesting insights. Uh, I would love an update on that story because I don't know what happened and how it's gone, but, but the mere connection of and sort of honest conversations between the parties in these situations, I think could be a, a, a great leap forward because it would allow them to start adapting, flexing, cooper, you know, collaborating. You know, that, that, Okay. Yes, and <laughs> yes, and um, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's wrong, what the problem is, and trying to solve it. And we don't spend, in my view, enough time trying to figure out what what's behind it when it does work. Yep. So that's an example of what's behind it when it does work. Um, and not too long ago, I was dealing with uh, how to think about mindset shifts, which is really what one way of labeling what has to happen in these kinds of community. Uh, and I went back to look at, it happened to be at a time when the uh, Cuyahoga River was celebrating the 50th, 50th anniversary of, of, of having formed such a group to clean up the Cuyahoga River, uh, which you would call caught fire. 
uh, back in 1960 something or other. Uh, 32 to 69, multiple times. Yeah. Yes, right. yes. And so, but when you go back and look at what happened to get them all there, um, you know, you can, you can start to see a pattern that's emerging in these other stories, which is that, that it was the pe pe people with different views, they could agree on having a clean river. That's, that's what they agreed on. Mm -hmm. And then take it from there. And we keep, we have these stories. We know this stuff. We know how this is working. And yet somehow when we get into, into these conversations, we are constrained by, well, the form of our conversations. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, along the same lines, the same woman was saying, part of the problem is everybody involved in this wants to make their name, including me. They want to make our name on this. You know, we see this as a huge thing. Lots of those people want to try and be the one, you know, or and and that really gets in the way of cooperating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my colleague and I were doing these interviews with the hopes that we can identify who the players are and and how well or how well they're not collaborating and offer them collaboration tools to help them do it better. That's that's our purpose in this. It's not entirely altruistic. <laughs> Love that. Interesting. Um, Captain Future, were you jumping in earlier? Were you uh, hoping to jump in? No, I'm just listening for now. Okay, I thought I saw your, your hand Susan raising. Is trying to jump in. Yeah, yep. exactly. And at this point, Susan is. So uh, pass, the, pass the mic to Susan. Well, you're going to be sorry that you got me involved because I talk a lot. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Tell me when to stop. But your story, the other Susan, was reminding me of the story of Belcanto that Francis Moore LePay wrote about uh, when she was there and they stopped hunger in that city. And um, she, after she visited and saw how it was working, she asked the mayor, I believe it was, well, how did you do this? And the mayor tears started falling because she said it was so simple. All we had to do was decide. So once we decide we want a good river or we want to save our shore or whatever, and we get our egos out of the way and we are together and joined, we can solve it. So, you know, again, I think it gets back to what we were saying earlier that when we, when our actions come from, it's not that there isn't always love, but when we release that to be what directs us and um, connect to the heart. I mean, I think that there's a lot of research now showing there's from Heart Math Institute that there's actually more pathways from the heart to the frontal cortex than the other way around. And when we learn to be more heart centered and directed, we can handle paradox, we can handle uh, polarities, we can handle dilemmas, we can come up with greater wisdom. So how do we get our communities to get to the heart of the matter and decide we wanna do this and when we're led in that way, then I think we can't figure these things out. This brilliant brain of yours that we're seeing here, Jerry, is amazing, but it's just, it makes our heads start to, <laughs> hard to get it all, you know, in mesh. But if we, if we slow down and, and are led in part from the heart, then we can bypass that need to make it all make sense in a way. Yeah. And I think you meant Belo, Belo Horizonte is the city that uh, you said. Uh, Bel, you said Belcanto, and I tried oh, to look yeah, that up. You're right. No, you're right. And I think you uh, mean I, Belo Horizonte. Yeah. Yeah, I can pull. I'll pull the book off the shelf and make sure. But that sounds right. Cool. And I'm adding some links to the chat about this. And it, it also reminds me of people I'm in. I've been a lot of future of work conversations, which my line on is, and they're never about the future of work itself. <laughs> mm. They're about the places we work and the people we work with and everything else. But the actual work um, has now been reduced to tasks, which is even more ridiculous. But anyway, the, um, uh, is that we really need these interpretive skills. People say, well, what do people need to learn how to do? And we need these interpretive skills. And it's not something an individual does. It is something that we do together. Um, and, and we're sorely lacking mm -hmm. in being more fine-grained about the steps that it takes to, to uh, make sense, to find relevance, to decide. And we don't, we don't, 
actually want to believe that every time we go into another conversation, we're this is a wonderful conversation, but take this conversation and try to have it again with someone else. You have to go in again with an open mind, <laughs> with um, you know, a willingness to let it all uh, unfold, and uh, but also nurturing it along to uh, to a uh, a decision. And it's not a decision; isn't an action step. With, with new people, you always have to start over. Right, and it's not just with new people. Well, yes, with different, with a different, con yeah. Yes, you do. On every, on every scale. It's a, it's a fractal process. I think, I think there's also, though, that morphogenic field. So, and I learned this, actually, uh, Doug, when we were at Spirited Work, that we, you built, like this group, I'm brand new to it. I have no idea how often you've met. And in a way we started a new, but not really, because I'm stepping into the strong field that you've created that makes me feel welcomed. I mean, at first I wasn't, but it, you know, it, it was. So I, I think it's not totally starting over. The fractal, it's like we, it, what do they call it? It uh, expands and includes, right, each time. So it's starting over, but it's bigger because it's still containing what was there before. Yeah, more potato field. Jerry's brain has a place for everything. It's amazing. We're How tired. many years have you been working on this, Jerry? Uh, this month, it's 22. Years? Years. Wow. So okay. I, I was on the brain's first press tour 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, saw the tool, wrote about them in the newsletter, invited them to our conference, gave them a little bit of spotlight, and then started using the tool uh, a month before they shipped it to the public. And the file that I'm showing you, this brain file, is the same file that I started 22 years ago. Wow. So that's, that's the reason that, um, that it's here. That, mm. that's, the, that's the reason it has so much stuff in it, is that I've, I've got one brain file. And I know other brain users who create lots of brain files. You know, Gene is, a, is an on-again, off-again brain user. Um, and I, we know many other people who are, who are uh, you know, brain addicted in different ways. And I've never seen a reason to have a second brain file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all connected. Yeah, Every, everything is deeply uh, intertwingled. Yeah, <laughs> intertwingled like that. So well, here's, here's everything is deeply intertwingled, uh, Ted, you know, which is Ted Nelson. And in fact, I need to connect to uh, my beliefs. Mm -hmm. So now it's connected to this much larger thought. Wow. About my beliefs. Huh. Boom. Oof. Well, I look forward to playing around with it. Uh, Jerry'sbrain.com, just click on the little text link that says launch Jerry's Brain, and you can browse all day. Send me emails about any part of it, like can't find this, do you have this, how do I use this, whatever. I'm happy mm -hmm. to, to respond. Wow. I will spread the word too, if that's okay. Oh, please, no, uh, definitely. Wow. And uh, if you'd like to be on the Inside Jerry's Brain mailing list so you'll get further notices of, this, of these kinds of calls, I'll add you to that. Please. Um, and we can go from there. All right. And we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, uh, did Gene already drop off? Uh, yes, okay. Um, and so I'm just, uh, does anybody have closing thoughts? Thanks, Susan. Uh, yeah, okay, I do. Um, so in a previous call, I made a point that, that about, ca about economies that I'd like to reinforce. The Egyptians had enormous surplus and they spent the surplus making cities for the dead. But they all agreed it was a fine thing to do. They all had something to do. It was meaningful for them and they did it and it worked for them. We build aircraft carriers, cars, F air, you know, armaments and this is what we've agreed to do we can change our minds and it's about values and so um i love the position about love that someone mentioned utterly there are millions of people every day that wake up and do things they don't have to do this world <laughs> is going on because of a lot of love out there um and lastly what my first point was trying to point out is there's going to be a lot of fear whenever we shift resources around and we're going to have to deal with that. Of course, people are going to be fearful. And that's all I want to say. And this has been an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you today. Same here. Um, 
and I'll add that one of the things that allows people to contemplate changing something big and being a little less fearful is seeing other people who survived that change and are doing okay on the other side of the river. And so they kind of need to see stones in the river. They, they need to see a path to the other way of being. And they need to see that people are okay in that other world, um, just metaphorically. And, 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 and that really helps. Nobody wants to be the, the dead person floating down the river like drowned. Um, and change looks dangerous and catastrophic. Uh, Susan, I'm gonna, uh, my, my normal practice is I'm gonna post this whole video. I've been recording, so I'm gonna post this all on YouTube. I'm then going to send a link to the video plus the text of the chat to everybody on the Inside Jury's brain list. And I'll, I will make sure to add you on that. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll add you to the list so that you can be on future notices for this. Great, how often do you tend to meet? Not often enough. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I haven't had an inside Jerry's brain call in a while. I, and and I'm, I'm terrible about thinking ahead far enough to get the word out to make the calls a little bit bigger. So any, any help on that I would appreciate. And any topics that you all would like to spawn as inside Jerry's brain calls, let me know. Uh, and we'll set them all up. Um, but I appreciate that. Any other, any other closing thoughts? Well, Jerry, I hope we continue this conversation because it's a really good one. Mm -hmm. and I think we've just started. I have two thoughts that have come to my mind. One is about capitalism. Uh, capitalism is treated as kind of a way of distributing resources, but it's actually a replacement for democracy. It gives those with money the right to make decisions for society. Mm -hmm. And it's very rooted in ownership. And we've got to cope with that. Also, it has a very, very long history. It's not something new. Uh, capitalism has been around for a long, long time. That is, elites owning the resources that make society work. And before you move, to the, sec before you move oh, to the second point, can I just jump in for one second and say that um, we tend to think that the package we live in is capitalism and democracy that these things are somehow naturally allies. That, like that's the thing we've been sold, is that the American dream is that we are in a capitalistic democratic society. And what you just said is a lovely contrast to that. My apologies, back to you in the booth. Well, um, the thing that's been on my mind a lot is I think we have an, idea, an agreement that we have to cut the use of fossil fuels, but we have no agreement as to how to do it and what the consequences would be. It stops the economy. We've got to cope with that. Yeah. It's actually a great segue for me, Doug. Thank you. Um, I just put a link in the chat to something called City Lab. There's an article that, the link to that article goes to Sweden's new um, storyteller in chief. I don't know his exact title, but um, the man is, uh, his job is to help people to um, visualize those stones across the river to, to a good future. That Climate change is not going to take root in people's hearts and minds and be carbon neutral and you know the going down by this amount each year. There have got to be positive stories that involve human beings doing things that are meaningful. And this guy is is on top of that in Sweden, and I think we can all learn from that. So I thought it'd be a useful thing to put up in the chat there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's Pierre Graham Christ. Yes, I believe so. Sweet. Yes, I know him. Michael, Captain Future, my friend Michael, this man is he's very quiet. He sits there and listens a lot, but he's quite deep and very well connected in the world of uh, sustainability. And, and Captain Future is aptly named. He is working hard on creating a, um, a good future for all of us. So mm. if you have to connect with him, please do so. Yeah. Love yeah. Please connect on Facebook with me. So. Oh, great. <laughs> Will do. Just did actually earlier today. Oh, there you are. You have your own part of his brain. <laughs> you are now you are now brain famous. That and four dollars will get you a coffee at Starbucks. Awesome. Yeah. I would just like to say in in closing, and maybe if we could go back to seeing all of us, because right? I'm I'm wow. I'm loving this that we're inside Jerry's brain. I mean, he has a way, yeah. but but here are all of our brains, and we're all here. So I'm just gazing for a moment at each of you and feeling just so 
uh, inspired to know your fantastic, amazing minds and brains and hearts are so committed. We're here because we care about our world and we're all doing what we can and we're so connected. Your, your beautiful mind map shows us. So it gives me a lot of hope and gratitude. So that's just what I wanted to leave with. Thank you very much. I love that. Yeah. Anyone else? Wrapping thoughts? You don't have to say them in rap. Yeah, I, I'm thankful to being part of an, yet another group talking about the future we want. So it's been amazing listening to you and I will come back as soon as I can. So, and thanks Ken for making me notice this. So. Brilliant. And uh, Michael, if it's okay, I'll add you to the Inside Jerry's Brain list. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Cool, people. Thank you. This has been really delightful. I'm, I, feel, I feel recharged, renewed, reinvigorated. Uh, and now off into our days. But, uh, well, okay. I need to book more of these calls. Please. Happy Merry Christmas, Han Han Solstice, Quansus, all those things. <laughs> Festivus. Okay. Festivus, yes. That's great. Exactly. I love Festivus. Bye. Thanks, Bye. all. Feats of strength, I think, right? <laughs>